Hello and welcome back to Intelligent Machine Monitoring. Today we are going to have a deep dive into gear monitoring together with Oliver Franz. Thanks for coming back to the studio. Thank you, Jules. Oliver, gear monitoring is quite a complex topic. What will be the key takeaways for our viewers? Yeah, uh, we will talk about the basic function of a gearbox. We will talk about the typical failure modes of a gearbox and how to detect those with methods of vibration monitoring. Okay, stage is yours. Thank you, Jost. Yes, welcome to today's session. So, gearboxes serve various purposes. In certain cases, they are used as speed reducers, speed increasers, or sometimes to produce something like counterclock rotating shafts or a clockwise rotating shaft or producing one or multiple output shafts with co-rotating or counter-rotating rotation sense. So these are typical purposes of gearboxes. Uh, what all gearboxes have in common, they do have a set of gears. In this example case I've sketched up here, we have a parallel shaft gear with a larger bull gear with a teeth count of 40 and a smaller also called the pinion gear with a tooth count of 15. So it's very interesting if you look into those gearboxes the way that the load gets transferred from one shaft to the other and looking into say a design detail of the teeth themselves you have to look at that from a perspective, a very detailed perspective of one tooth making contact to the other and in fact what's interesting is that these teeth are not straight but they have a curved shape so you have a nice lubrication between those two sliding surfaces and in fact they're also like not only a point contact but they have a certain length to them so there is a certain power that can be transmitted. So what I just said is, every time one tooth mates with the other, there is this tooth contact leaving an impact, which is called and translated into a so-called gear mesh frequency. The gear mesh frequency is calculated based on the speeds of the input and output shaft, as well as the tooth count. In my example case, with an input shaft, say, turning at 3000 RPM, which equals to 3000 RPM is 50 cycles per second is equal to 50 Hertz. Now in my example we have a gear ratio of 40 to 15 so the speed of the output shaft the FO in this case would be the 3000 RPM times 40 by 15 which is 8000 RPM. So the output shaft in this example, putting in 3000, would turn at 8000 RPM. 8000 RPM is also equivalent to a 2 points, this is something like 2.6 gear ratio. So this is equivalent to something like a 133 Hertz turning frequency. So this is my speeds and looking at the gear mesh frequency, we have the turning speed of the shaft, so we have the, the 50 hertz, and multiply that with the number of teeth of 40 for the, for the appropriate shaft, which results into a 2000 hertz gear mesh frequency. And this gear mesh frequency is important for everything you do around gear monitoring because this will be as soon as you turn the, speed, the, turn the gear you will see this as the prominent frequency in your spectrum, in your fast Fourier transformation, your spectral data where you have the two axes labeled with frequency on the x-axis, on the y-axis we have the acceleration typically measured in G's and those can be measured in back to my example gearbox so we may have an accelerometer mounted here on top of this casing this is an acceleration sensor that monitors the vibration of the gearbox and this should be coupled with a speed sensor to detect the true turning speed of the input shaft now looking at the frequency spectrum, what I would find as a really dominant peak here is a 
GMF, gear mesh frequency peak, at my frequency of 2000 hertz, or 40 times running speed. So this is 2000 hertz, or 40 times of the shaft speed we see a gear contact. This is also called the one-time GMF, which builds a harmonic set of the two times GMF and so forth. And the three times, etc. Three times GMF. Now, when you're looking at the different failure modes that a gear may have or the different specifics around a gearbox, there are very prominent cases like a overload situation. When you do overload that gearbox, in this case, just wipe this out again. In a loading situation, load will increase or decrease this very peak in amplitude. So load as well as a lack of lubrication, having lubrication between these two components is a very key element. Lack of lubrication as well as a loading change will be visible in the height of the amplitude of those gear mesh frequency peaks in my spectral data. Other forms of issues could be um, following a long period of lack of lubrication, you may wear out the teeth, which leads to an additional play, additional distance between two teeth mating after each other. And in this case, you would find um, a different failure mode, and that's visible in so-called sidebands. You would produce sidebands to the main gear mesh frequency around this main peak, and these are an indication for the quality of the mating or the for quality of the contact. So if you will, the, the amplitude of the gear mesh frequency peak is an indicator of the quality of lubrication and the loading of the machine. And the existence of sidebands and their amplitude is an indicator for the quality of the tooth contact among each other, indicators for wear. And if at a later stage you may end up in a situation with chipped teeth, chipped teeth is something where you lose components of the gear, so you're breaking off parts of the tooth, so you're building like little, little ho holes within, that's a chipped tooth. This will be visible in the side bending as well as the worst um, case scenario you're probably breaking off the entire tooth. That's obviously something really critical. This will also be visible in the sidebands of the gear mesh frequency. Are there uh, any other analysis to um, detect or um, find broken tooth? Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So let me just first conclude on the gear mesh frequency. Um, so there is the, the side banding at that 1x spreading. There is a 1x, that's the turning frequency spreading of these side bands, or put it like in a larger perspective. So if this is spaced at the 1x turning frequency, say 50 hertz, then it's obvious the side band belongs to the left, the input shaft gear turning at 50 hertz, or if the 1x is spaced at a larger frequency, say, uh, 133 hertz, then it belongs to the right, the pinion gear, and would then relate to a failure of the pinion gear from a spectrum perspective. Your, your question, very important, and yes, it's true, it's very important to monitor the proper functionality of the gears, and there is another method that is utilized, it's so-called the TSA, time synchronous averaging, and the TSA utilizes the same acceleration data, but rather than putting it into a spectrum, it utilizes a time waveform data. So if we use a same coordinate system again, on the x-axis we have time, and this is again acceleration in g's, and Important here is it's time synchronous averaging, so it always locks in at a full completion of one turn. This is one full revolution, and we record the vibration that is recorded in a, any given turn. So this could be the vibration curve around a full turn, and 
if you look at that in detail, every one of these peaks actually is a representation of two teeth mating each other, making a contact. And now if you would count that, this, this could be the 15th tooth contacts among this single revolution. And this is a full 360 degree turn. And in fact, multiple revolutions are captured one after the other up to thousands and they all produce a very equivalent pattern over time because other like noise or random things over time eliminate themselves. And the same would be applicable for a TSA if you limit the full turn to say the 15 tooth wheel, the 40 tooth wheel will not influence the TSA because it's not synchronous. It's not synchronous to the full turn data acquisition and will over, over time eliminate itself. This TSA is then further analyzed in a so-called kurtosis analysis. The kurtosis is a reflection of how even, how equal does each contact is compared to the one next to it. It's a statistical evaluation where you put all the sample points into a statistical eva evaluation of a Gauss curve. And ideally, that Gauss curve has a very natural distribution and that kurtosis value is ideally is a number one. That's a natural distribution. But when you develop something with a breaking tooth over this turn, you have a lot of smooth operation and at some point during the stroke, during the revolution, you have a peak standing out caused by a single broken tooth, for example. That single broken tooth leaves an impact every time it makes contact to the opposing gear. The broken tooth creates that impact at the very same point in the shaft crank angle, the shaft angle. So for example, in this case, you have that broken tooth contact at this position and it repeats, repeats, repeats. It builds a very strong pattern, which leads in turn to a kurtosis value or a statistics evaluation of a very peaky standard distribution with a kurtosis much higher than the number one. So normally we found kurtosis values, they may be in the area around between three and 10. That's a very normal value. When you have a broken tooth, we talk about kurtosis probably close to 50 or 100 many times. Two more comments, that, uh, two words of caution with the TSA. Um, the kurtosis is sensitive to everything that happens in a synchronous way that is time synchronized to this shaft. If you are driving equipment that also produces synchronous impacting, these will also be visible in the time synchronous averaging. So this needs to be taken into consideration in the baselining. And another aspect of that, all the other capabilities we've discussed in a previous session around high frequency enveloping regarding signal processing are also available for TSA. Thank you for that, Oliver. Very interesting. Um, one question from my side, you draw in just one accelerometer for this um, example. How many sensors do you use typically on a gearbox of a larger format? Yeah, as a rule of thumb, it'd be really advisable on a larger gearbox to have each shaft equipped with at least one radial sensor on either side. So this will be on either side of the gearbox. Um, and one axial sensor per each shaft. So this dual shaft in the simplified example, um, we would end up with a typical good sensor outfit of six acceleration sensor mounted onto the bearings. So you would have the bearings right here and this is where they should go. So the, bear, the acceleration sensor shown here in my example is a very rough scheme. They should rather be on the bearings of course to where the load is being transmitted, where the signal will best be available and it has to be a radial on each bearing as well as one in axial direction on each shaft. So six and a speed sensor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are producing a double feature this morning and uh, maybe Oliver so kind of give us a little cliffhanger of what's coming up next. Yeah, thank you, Jules. Yeah, we will have another session later and we talk about, the, about functional safety, SIL certification and the value and why this is relevant for you. Okay, so additional interesting stuff to come up. So stay tuned here at Intelligent Machine Monitoring. Thank you. Mm -hmm.